Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, the afternoon session of the fourth day of the Vanya College Symposium on the Holocaust and Genocide. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Marlene Grossman. I am a psychology teacher at Vanya College and also coordinate the symposium. Um, I would also like to introduce you to our guest speaker. Um, Al Dr. Alan Whitehorn, Whitehorn is an emer emeritus professor of political science at the Royal Military College of Canada. He received his BA from York in political science and history and his MA and PhD from Carleton in political science. Um, in the mid 70s, he, search, he, he served as the research director at the David Lewis Memoirs. From 1978 to 2011, he was a professor of political science at RMC. In the mid-1990s, he was the first holder of, of the J.S. Woodworth Chair in Humanities at Simon Fraser University. As an academic, he writes on the topic of genocide, human rights, political parties, and elections. As a poet, he explores the issue of genocide and its impact on the Armenian-Canadian identity. His books include The Armenian Genocide, Resisting the Inertia of Indifference, Blue Heron from Kingston in Kingston, 2001, Ancestral Voices, Identity, Ethnic Roots, and a Genocide Remembered uh, in 2007, Just Poems, Reflections of an Armenian Genocide in 2009, Return, Return to Armenia um, in 2012, and the Armenian Genocide, The Essential Guide in 2015. And he will be talking about remembering the causes and consequences of the Armenian Genocide and confronting denial. So Dr. Whitehorn, welcome. And whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene, and thank you to Vanier College students and staff and guests uh, for this symposium. And it's an honor to be here uh, participating. <clears throat> I will speak on the Armenian Genocide, which occurred between 1915 and 1923, so during and after World War I. And uh, to help us all along, I'm going to try and share the screen at this moment. So let's see how we do. That should be it. Is that working? Yes. Okay, great. Now I just go to uh, slideshow. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm talking on remembering the causes and consequences of the Armenian genocide and quite important uh, dealing with uh, denial, confronting denial. Now, there will be about four sections to this 20-minute uh, talk, uh, overview and questions, plus brief definitions. And then I'll be talking about the background and causes. Uh, and then we'll focus on that key pivotal year of 1915 when so much happened, so many died, and so many were uprooted. Uh, and then lastly, we'll deal with memory, looking at the legacy and the lessons uh, that we can try and draw. <clears throat> Now, before I begin, you might want to think about what genocides are remembered and written about and which are not and why. Uh, the largest uh, coverage is on the, the Holocaust, but until recently, very little was written about, for example, the indigenous genocide of peoples around the globe, North America, Australia, and elsewhere, or even about the uh, the Hararo in Southwest Africa at the beginning of the 20th century. So you might want to think about why are some genocides remembered and written about and some are not, or many are not. <clears throat> now, when we look at the concept of genocide, it really overlaps with several other key legal uh, concepts. And chronologically, they were developed in the order of war crimes. Uh, the Hague conferences in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries uh, tried to regulate uh, war. Uh, the uh, weapons of war had become so dangerous, so deadly that they felt they needed to regulate uh, the conduct of war. Uh, during World War I, we saw the emergence of a very important concept, the concept of crimes against humanity. Uh, the Russian, French, and British uh, foreign officers issued a joint declaration during World War I commenting on denouncing the forced deportations and massacres of the civilian Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And then during World War II, 
we have Raphael Lemkin creating the legal concept of genocide, trying to um, explain, try to help uh, describe the, the conditions of the uh, mass killings of the Jews and uh, others uh, during the Holocaust and World War II. The three terms are interrelated. They, they overlap to, to varying degrees. And usually at the International Criminal Court and other tribunals, um, the perpetrators are often uh, charged with all three of these crimes. So keep that in mind when we're looking at uh, the concept of genocide. Now, when we're looking at genocide, one probably needs to deal with the issue of nationalism. And nationalism can take a number of forms. It can be open and tolerant, and we associate that with uh, the democratic form of nationalism, of national self-determination, of, of liberation. But there can be a closed and intolerant version, and that often is exclusionary and sometimes quite aggressive. Now, uh, Raphael Lemkin and others have noted that ethnic slaughter has been throughout history for thousands of years. And we have uh, examples going all the way back to antiquity. So we should remember that while we've created the concept of genocide and the concept of crimes against humanity uh, in the 20th century, the actual deeds of, uh, of genocidal slaughter actually go back thousands of years. Uh, so it's important to consider this when studying the Armenian Genocide of 1915 onwards because it predates the development of the term genocide and uh, is tied very much with the emergence of the concept of crimes against humanity. Now, most of you know the concept of genocide in a general way, but it might be useful to remind ourselves that genocide is a crime directed against a group. The individual that may suffer the fate is very much defined as part of a, a targeted group. The 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide featured the following aspects, killing members of a group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group, deliberately inflicting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, forcibly transferring children of one group to another. Now, I've deliberately highlighted uh, the key word group in each of those clauses. Uh, so it had a group focus. Now, not all groups are protected under the Genocide Convention. Only four specific groups are protected, national, ethnic, religious, or racial. So one of the criticisms in recent decades of the Genocide Convention is it hasn't protected enough other groups. We will see that the Armenians were targeted and victimized as a group, both as a religious group and as an ethnic and national group. Now, when looking at the Armenian genocide, uh, it's one of the more difficult genocides to teach. All genocides are difficult to teach and require uh, special sensitivity uh, for the victim group, but also trying to understand the complexities of why people do such horrible deeds, terrible deeds. Uh, when looking at the Armenian genocide, one of the challenges is it's more than a century ago, 105 years ago. Um, a lot of the borders have changed. Uh, people are more focused with crises and uh, uh, the plight of, uh, of victims today. The other thing is the, the borders of the Near East have changed quite a bit. The names have been changed. So it's a complex history to try to understand. And the third reason uh, the Armenian genocide is a, a challenge to teach is that the perpetrator state and its successor states, Turkey, uh, denies the genocide occurred. And it's not just passive denial saying, well, you agree with genocide, but we disagree. Uh, it's active denial, trying to intimidate scholars who write about uh, genocide, uh, even to the point of threats. More about that another time, perhaps. 
Now, when we look at the Armenian genocide, we can pose a number of the W5 questions, who, where, when, what, why. These are the W questions of Medzia Gern. And Medzia Gern means the great crime or some translated as great uh, calamity. But in any case, it's the notion of a catastrophe from which people are not ever going to fully recover. It, it defines the national identity because it's been so traumatic. So what is the Armenian genocide? Where did it take place? When did it occur? Who were the perpetrators? Who were the victims? Were there reliable witnesses? What were the causes? What were the consequences even to this day? What are the implications and what do we know and remember today? And what, if any, lessons? Now we begin with who are the Armenians? They lived in the land surrounding the biblical Mount Ararat and became the first Christian state in 301 uh, Common Era. Uh, they have a unique language and alphabet that is a challenge to many non-Armenians. They inhabited at their peak the lands from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the Black Sea in the north to the Caspian Sea in the east. So historically, uh, you know, basically a thousand years ago, uh, you can see uh, this is the Armenian landscape. Uh, here's the Mediterranean Sea in the west, Black Sea in the north, and the Caspian Sea in the east. And it covers parts of what today would be Syria, Lebanon, of course, Eastern Turkey, uh, and the Southern Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and parts of um, Azerbaijan and even parts of uh, uh, today's Iran. Now, where were the Armenians living? Well, for the 2000 or so years that the Armenians inhabited this general area, they were caught between rival imperial empires. This is a fate that sometimes happens to smaller countries, smaller uh, nations. Uh, they were caught between the ancient Greeks and the Persians, between Rome and Persia, between Russia and Persia, and more recent uh, centuries between the Ottoman Turks and Tsarist Russia. Now on the eve of the 20th century, so on the eve of the, the genocide, uh, the 19th century Armenian nation was divided into two key fragments. A Western half was found within the Muslim Ottoman Empire, and that was about 2 million Armenians. And the Eastern half was found within the Christian Russian Empire. The genocide occurred only in the Ottoman Empire during World War I and after, the Western half of the Armenian homeland. Now here you can see a map where historically at the beginning of the 20th century Armenians were located. Uh, this was part of the Ottoman Empire and the green uh, provinces were the Armenian uh, provinces um, in the eastern part of the Ottoman Empire. In the, um, I guess, yellow and gold, this was where the Armenians were located in the, the Russian Empire. So you can see the Armenian nation was bifurcated. It was split into two halves, one half under one empire the other half under another empire. Uh, there was no self-rule in any meaningful sense. Now the Ottoman Empire is one that most in the West don't know a lot about. It was one of the world's major imperial states. It was a large, powerful, multi-ethnic empire that existed from the 14th century to the 20th century. Um, and it, 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 it covered from North Africa, Egypt, parts of the uh, Saudi Arabian Peninsula, the Balkans, uh, what we now know as Anatolia or, or Turkey, uh, the, the South and much of the North Caucasus uh, and, and the Crimea. So this was a large empire. Now, as often happens with empires, you have a rise by uh, military victories and a fall and, and in this case, uh, decade by decade in the 19th century, we see parts of the empire uh, breaking off, people declaring independence. Um, so we have parts of North Africa, parts of the Balkans, 
uh, and eventually parts of uh, the Middle East breaking away. So that in the end, there would only be this uh, rump state, it's a large rump state, but it's, uh, it, it is what we now know as, as Turkey, but it's nowhere near the size that the Ottoman Empire once was. Now, when we look at the reasons for genocide, there are a number of factors. Uh, there are four key ones. I think the first is the notion that there was ethnic and religious inequality of the Armenians under an autocratic Ottoman regime. The Armenians were subjects, unequal subjects. They were not considered believers of the true faith of Islam. They were forced to pay additional taxes as non-believers. They were banned from carrying weapons and they were victims of periodic harassment, looting and killing. And as the Ottoman Empire declined, it became not surprisingly more repressive. Um, the minorities, including the Armenians, suffered more hardship. And as the empire was declining, the rulers of the Ottoman Empire began to look for scapegoats. And we rarely blame ourselves, and particularly political leaders rarely blame themselves. They look for scapegoats. And the Christian minority of Armenians, Greeks, and Assyrians would be obvious targets since they were considered uh, non-believers of the true faith. And they were increasingly seen as enemies within uh, a misperception, but nevertheless a perception. Second major reason is the decline of the Ottoman Empire. As the Ottoman Empire began to decline in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, not only did they lose land, but hundreds of thousands of Muslims fled uh, the newly independent Christian states. Uh, there was, if you like, religious and ethnic cleansing occurring. Uh, and if it wasn't actually occurring, it, there was the fear of it occurring. So we have about a million Muslims fleeing from the Balkans and Southern Russian Empire to Anatolia, what is now Turkey. And so a smaller Ottoman Empire that eventually would become Turkey was emerging, but it was also not only smaller, it was becoming more homogeneous. It was no longer a big diverse empire, but was becoming smaller and a higher percentage of Muslims and fewer percentage wise Christians. As such, the Armenians became increasingly a vulnerable minority. <clears throat> Now we had earlier uh, massacres in the 1890s, about 200,000 Armenians perished in the Hamidian massacres and the perpetrators, uh, the Muslim perpetrators uh, were not punished for the most part. So the impunity sets up a bad precedent for future possible genocide. Now, uh, as you might guess, when a regime is starting to lose its territory, uh, there are some who think we've got the solution. And there was a military coup. The Young Turk coup was a violent revolutionary nationalist uh, uh, takeover. And it was uh, run by the Committee of Union and Progress, CUP uh, for short. And its goal was to make a more modern, powerful Ottoman Empire in the words of today, you know, to make Turkey great again. The rising Turkish nationalism was directed against the Christians, uh, Armenians, Greeks, or Syrians. Now, if you've been part of the million Muslims who fled the Christians from the Balkans, you would not be looking uh, positively, perhaps, to Christians of any faith. And so it's not surprising that that anger, that hostility at being displaced would be directed at others. Um, the leaders of the Turkish dictatorship were Talat, Enver, and Jema, the so-called three pashas. Now the young Turks who led this coup pursued an extreme nationalist ideology. They were trying to compensate for the loss of the lands in the Balkans by trying to build a new Pan-Turan empire in the east. So they lost land in the north and they thought we can find it in the east, in Central Asia. And of course, one of the problems was the Armenian people, uh, the, uh, the region where the Armenians were populated were in the way. There was this Christian obstacle, if you like. 
So the plan was by the, the Young Turk regime to resettle the area with Muslims from the Balkans, to depopulate the area of Armenians, to annihilate the Christians, and the goal was to create a more homogeneous society. So in other words, they were destroying the old Ottoman Empire and building a new modern, uh, more homogeneous and far less tolerant nation of Turkey. And they were willing as a revolutionary party to employ violence, and they created special paramilitary killing units, the special organizations, which are very reminiscent of, of, of the equivalent during World War II that the Nazis employed. Now, the last major factor that I want to look at is war and genocide. During war, terrible deeds and crimes are committed. States' powers are greatly increased, and there's much more uh, secrecy, and there's certainly a greater sense of vulnerability of, of the leadership and the nation. The Ottoman Empire had over 10,000 German military advisors at the highest level all the way down into the field. And the German advisors were advocating total war that included targeting unarmed civilians. Now, the Ottoman Empire leaders perceived that they were besieged uh, on all fronts. Russian uh, Empire's threat in the east, the British and French naval threat in the west, the Arab revolt in the south, and they questioned that the Greek and Armenian communities within the Ottoman Empire uh, might be disloyal. So they opted for extreme measures directed at the Greeks and Armenians, actually against the Greeks that started even before World War I. Now 1915 is a decisive military year in World War I for the Ottoman Empire. In January, um, the Ottoman army went into the Caucasus Mountains uh, in December and January and fought a bloody war at Sarakamish and lost most of their troops either to uh, uh, battles or, or the, the terrible conditions of winter in the Caucasus Mountains. In March, the British and French fleets sailed into the Dardanelles Straits in attempting to capture Constantinople. And they were about in April to land at Gallipoli. The English, Australian, and New Zealand troops, Anzac troops, were about to land in Gallipoli. So the day before the landing, uh, the young Turk regime opted to arrest and eventually kill the Armenian leadership in Constantinople. It was kind of a beheading of the Armenian leadership, civilian leadership. So 1915 is a fateful year of the Armenian genocide. Senior young Turk official used secrecy and war censorship and mobilized for total war. And they sent secret coded telegraph messages. By February, Armenian men in the Ottoman army were disarmed, put into labor units, and eventually killed. They had been conscripts, so they had been serving uh, the, in the Ottoman uh, military. On April 24th, I've already mentioned, the key Armenian leaders were rounded up, most were killed, and that included the leading Armenian clergy and intellectuals, including poets. Uh, the following weeks and months, Armenian men in each city were ordered to assemble, they were tied up en masse, marched out of the city, and massacred uh, in some remote uh, valley or, or a road. And here you can see one of the pictures taken by a very brave uh, person. It was illegal to take pictures during the genocide, but uh, some brave souls uh, opted to be witnesses to, to the massacres and deportations. <clears throat> In May, we have the law of deportation. So the Turkish state ordered women, children, and the elderly on long force marches with only a day or two's notice. And unable to take possessions of supplies, they were sent into the uh, terrible conditions of the deserts uh, that were uh, brutally hot, uh, insufficient water, and, and certainly no food to speak of. They were not prote protected from marauding gangs and the special killing units. Girls and young boys were often taken into Muslim homes and forced into religious conversion. And here's a famous picture of uh, a woman and her child uh, in the de deportation. Now we can look at this map. Uh, it's basically looking at uh, what we know as uh, uh, Turkey today. 
and you can see where the uh, massacres were occurring, mostly in the eastern part of what we now know as Turkey. Uh, and the, the routes can be seen along the red lines, uh, moving towards uh, the desert of what is now Syria, Dazor. Uh, but they were going through uh, very difficult mountain conditions. In some cases, we have people shipped into the Black Sea and dumped, uh, tied up and dumped into the waters to drown. In September, we have the law of confiscation where Armenian property was officially confiscated by the state. Mobs often took Armenian belongings. Tens of thousands of Armenians were shipped in cattle cars to remote desert er areas. And here's one of the scenes in the desert of Syria. State decreed forced deportation, starvation, torture, and death of hundreds of thousands occurred in 1915 and 1916. By 1923, it was reported that about uh, one and a half million Armenians had died, either been killed or perished under brutal conditions. Now there were witnesses, uh, officially neutral Americans in 1915, they hadn't entered World War I, so we have Armenian, sorry, American uh, ambassador, consuls, and missionaries. Uh, we have a lot of, of what was originally secret reports by Germany, the Ottoman ally, uh, but now have been declassified and we, we see a lot of uh, accounts by German military and diplomatic officials who were there on the scene reporting about uh, the conditions. Uh, in an age of telegraph, we had quite a bit of international coverage. The New York Times had about 120, 130 articles in 1915 on the plight of the Armenians, and they struggled with the words to describe the mass deportations and massacres. They tried to describe the indescribable. The word genocide had yet to be created. And here you can see one example of uh, a headline or two from the New York Times. Now, we also had, quite importantly, the emergence of a new international legal term, crimes against humanity. England, France, and Tsarist Russia, in their joint declaration, warned of the crimes of Turkey against humanity and the need after the war to punish the guilty. So when we look at the features of what happened, there were forced deportations, uh, their property was stripped away, they were denied food and medical services, they were tortured, uh, there was destruction of cultural sites to monasteries and churches, and there were ethnic massacres. These are all features of genocide. And here you can see a line of orphans. Now, how was the Armenian genocide stopped? You know, you'd like to think eventually a reason emerges and people stop. But in fact, it was the defeat of the Ottoman army by the British and French allies in 1918. If the young Turk dictatorship had not been stopped, the genocide would have been more total. And I would remind you that a number of major genocides of the 20th century, the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust, the Cambodian killing fields and the Rwandan genocide were all stopped by an external army. The importance of hard power to stop uh, the perpetrators of genocide. Now today, more Armenians live in the diaspora than in the ancestral homelands in Turkey. From 2 million before World War I, only about 50,000 Armenians live in Turkey today, and they are a very vulnerable minority. In that sense, the genocide succeeded in one brutal statistical level. And it's reinforced by the fact that the Turkish government today still engages in denial. It renames towns and cities. The monasteries and churches were destroyed or allowed to fall into ruin. That's a form of cultural genocide. The Turkish legal code made uh, speaking about the genocide a crime. And we, we can note the, 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 the prominent Turkish Armenian journalist Hrant Dink was assassinated in 2007 for his uh, speaking up about genocide and human rights in, in Turkey. We still have the Turkish government closing the border with tiny landlocked Armenia 
the former lands that had been part of the Tsarist and Soviet empire, if you like, the other historic half of the Armenian nation. And the, the, the denialism continues to this day. Now, recognition of genocide is important, and I'll just close with a couple of quick points. It's important for the victim to give some sense of closure. It's important for the perpetrator society that it can begin to have an honest debate about history and foster civil society and greater pluralism within Turkey. And it's important for other states in the world because it helps promote solidarity on human rights and international law. Now it was a long struggle, but in Canada, we had recognition of the Armenian genocide beginning with the Senate in 2002, then the House of Commons in 2004, culminating in the official statement by Prime Minister Harper in 2006. Now I'd like to shift very briefly from being an academic to telling a personal story. In 1915, aid workers helped a young orphan girl. She never knew her real name or age, and she had lived in refugee camps for more than 10 years. That orphan child was my grandmother, my Metzmama. And because someone offered a helping hand to a hungry, terrified, lonely child, I am able to speak to you today. And so I ask you for the orphans of genocide that exist around the world today, wherever they cry out, please resist the sin of indifference and provide a helping hand. Thank you. Thank you so very much for that uh, great presentation on the Armenian genocide. And for sure for some of the students who are here today, they don't really know too much about the Armenian genocide. So it's important that we keep talking about it. I do have one question. Um, Ara writes, good day, Professor Whitehorn. Can you can you speak to us about the vestiges of and linkages between the Armenian genocide, Armenia's post-genocide context, the denial by Turkey, its perpetrator, and what's been going on most recently in Nagamo Garapash? Nagorno Karabakh. Yeah. I know I didn't <clears throat> say that well. Sorry, Ara. That's all right. It's a tough uh, <laughs> phrasing. Uh... The fact that uh, Armenians who have experienced the genocide and previous massacres uh, increases their sensitivity to any new massacres or potential for new massacres. So when the Soviet Union was breaking up in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there were a number of, of pogroms and massacres in Azerbaijan. The Armenians were a minority, a Christian minority, in Azerbaijan, which is overwhelmingly a uh, uh, Muslim uh, republic. And um, <clears throat> so Armenians uh, began to have to flee from uh, Azerbaijan. And conversely, uh, Azerbaijani minority that had been in Armenia fled from there. You know, it, when you get into uh, ethnic uh, forced relocations and threats, uh, there's a great tendency for people to flee to, to safety wherever they can. So um, the history of Armenians in Azerbaijan held territory has been one of being a persecuted minority um, and where in recent decades, meaning the, the late 1980s, early 1990s, there had been pogroms and massacres. Now, Nagorno-Karabakh was a kind of autonomous region in the former Azerbaijani Republic that was part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was made up of 15 republics. Armenia was one, Azerbaijan was one, Georgia was another one, and so on. Um, within the republics, there were sometimes little enclaves for ethnic minorities where they'd have some latitude, but not a lot in the, in the former Soviet Union. Anyway, to make a long story short, Nagorno-Karabakh was 80% Armenian and 20% Azerbaijani. And they did not want to be part of, when the Soviet Union broke up, they did not want to be part of an independent nationalist Azerbaijan. They wanted to be either independent or join with Armenia. Azerbaijan said no, 
So Nagorno-Karabakh fought a war of national self-determination after it declared independence a couple of times. And uh, Azerbaijan uh, fought to try to retain control of that land. So it was a classic debate of national self-determination and democracy, if you like, versus territorial integrity and imperial rule or rule by a larger, more powerful force. Now, at some point, Armenia, the country, the newly independent Armenia got involved too to help their fellow Armenians. And that's where we were at the end of uh, the 1990s when um, a peace a a truce was kind of signed in 94. And then for uh, three, almost three decades, it was uh, an unsteady truce, but one that was uh, okay for Armenians, but the Azerbaijanis had lost a lot of land around Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and they were determined to take it all back, not only the surrounding lands, but Nagorno-Karabakh. And then in the last month, we've seen uh, a rearmed Azerbaijan fueled by petrodollars, um, able to reclaim all its land and even big chunks of Nagorno-Karabakh. And the 140,000 Armenians that were in Nagorno-Karabakh have mostly fled. Uh, the children and women fled first, but now even adult males are now starting to leave en masse um, because they were becoming encircled by the um, Azerbaijani armed forces and whoever else was there. There were um, allegedly several thousand uh, Syrian fighters that were hired by Turkey to um, to participate. Anyway, that's a long, complex answer to a very difficult topic. <laughs> For sure. I mean, it's a very long, difficult topic. This whole topic is very long and difficult. But um, I did have one question and then a comment from, from um, an audience member. What is the benefit um, of Turkey's denial? I mean, most countries agree that 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 the Armenian genocide happened. So why do they keep deny it? Well, there are, there are psychological reasons, you know, why do grandparents uh, and, and their offspring uh, refuse to admit that the grandparent did something wrong, right? You know, sexually abused kids or something, right? Uh, psychologically, it's hard to admit that uh, your forefathers did something terrible. Uh, first of all, they don't want to recognize it as, as adults, but their, their offspring often don't. The second thing is the fear, well, wait a minute, uh, will they want to have uh, reparations? Will they want to have the land back? Um, so the, there's that financial factor. And ultimately, the other reason is they've been taught a history that is, if you like, false or different from what the rest of the world has been taught. So uh, before the internet, the, the Turkish state was really able to control what Turkish children were getting in the school system. And even now, it's a very skewed education or if you like, miseducation about what happened in 1915. There are oodles of uh, denialist books and pamphlets uh, out there. And uh, I always say, if you want to stop genocide, you've got to stop um, the histories that tell false stories about the massacres of the past. Uh, and you have to change also the stereotypes about the targeted group. So there are a lot of reasons why morally they shouldn't, and you know, the brave individuals in Turkish civil society who spoke up um, and uh, paid a price. Either they're in exile or they were jailed at some point, or in the case of Khran Dink, he was assassinated. So I wanted to end with a comment from Nora. She says, thank you so very much to Professor Whitehorn for this informative presentation. Your personal words at the end about your Metz Mama brought uncontrollable tears to my eyes. As an Armenian, I am grateful for her and all of your research. And I think it's a very fitting way to end today's session. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, it's my responsibility to, to help others uh, as best I can because uh, my grandmother had uh, for more than 10 years 
different people providing a helping hand. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for such a great presentation. Um, Barbara also says thank you. And uh, I, I hope to hear from you again soon. And, and hopefully at some point we'll see each other in Montreal. Yes. <laughs> in the meantime, I guess it's Zoom. Yes, correct. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.